Okay, hello everybody. I uh, do I have a mic? Can I have a? Is it is it yeah. this one? Okay. Um, I wriggle around quite a bit, so <laughs> terrible. But anyway, um, tell me if you can't hear me. So I'm going to talk about unified compositional symbolic execution. And in two thousand uh, in two thousand and sixteen. I organised a meeting at the Royal Society and Gordon Plotkin was introducing me and he introduced me by saying what a terrible choice it was to be organiser of a meeting at the same time as doing a talk. And my answer was yes. And I had in my head and, and throughout the years I have tended not to uh, um, organise at the same time as speak. And what happened this time? Well, I've organised the biggest me meeting I've ever organised, and I've done a talk at Peter's 60th um, meeting and uh, Patrice's uh, 75th uh, meeting, because how could I say no? So thank you very much for inviting me. I wonder if it's a good idea. We will see. <laughs> and my ambition was <laughs> to spend a huge amount of time over Christmas nailing this, nailing what it means to do, uh, to have all these different types of um, uh, semantic triples and integrate it in all the work I'm doing. Instead, there was a, I had the weight of popple rather than the weight of this cube. The popple weight was bigger. And uh, also my family, not me, got COVID. So we had an interesting Christmas. Um, so just to say, when I say unified, um, I'm sorry, you're going to be so disappointed. <laughs> and maybe one day. <laughs> so what I'd like to talk about is semi-automatic analysis tools like Viper, Verifast, Infer, that sort of thing. I have my own one, Gillian. And I am a little bit different from, uh, some, uh, from say, Pete. So what's, what's happened in the past has been very much, there's those amazing people doing theoretical um, work, and those other amazing people doing what does it mean to get the um, static analysis tools into industry. And there hasn't been much join between them. And so represented by these two sources, they're kept away from each other, uh, or keeping away from each other. And then we get to someone like um, Pete O'Hearn, and there are many others, where absolutely these things are beginning to come together. But at the same time, certainly in Pete's um, case, there are the nugget ideas in um, uh, those uh, theory papers that are as simple as possible. And there's the macho um, industry tool with all the bells and whistles. And the connection between them is there, but it's not um, explicit. And I've got the luxury that I'm an academic. So I don't have to justify myself to the uh, industrial companies. I don't have to go huge macho engineering thing. And I can actually pause and uh, think what I personally want a bit more. So I've had an agenda for quite a few years to try to marry the theory with the sort of work we're doing at the implementation stuff. And I've come from theory, so I've got a learning curve to get to the um, practice. And uh, let's see where we go in terms of how well um, we've done with that. And in particular, sort of one motivation, whether it would be Pete or Byron or Dan, uh, Daniel Kronig, is what on earth are they doing in that industry tool world? And can I begin to understand it from my place? So that's the motivation for me starting with this sort of work. And 
a team of us developed uh, what's called the Gillian platform, which is a platform for developing um, semi-automatic analysis tools for several um, programming languages. The two of our examples are JavaScript and C. And partly because the characters involved and, and just uh, given the way things were working, they tended to be that the ideas and the um, thought process was going on in the, um, in the implementation work, and then we would rush to get the formalism out for the whatever <coughs> paper we were doing. And so the practice was um, leading the theory, and um, that's where we were for the last few years, with some good nuggets coming out, but there was something I was um, less happy about in terms of... I'm a theorist. So my aim is, or our collective aim is, what does it mean to marry theory and practice in perfect harmony? And let's see where we get to with this. So my current agenda and what I will be talking about uh, now is to pinpoint what unified compositional symbolic execution is in this theoretical place. Meanwhile, we've got that Gillian platform that is full of <coughs> optimizations. It's difficult code to read. And, uh, but the ideas for this came from here. So the, it, absolutely, the, the, the original uh, work was from here. And now we have the person sitting on the two, uh, uh, standing on the two horses, which is Andreas, who's around somewhere then, who is, uh, did a Haskell implementation that streamed between um, the two places. And in particular, this Haskell implementation and, and basically pseudocode that can be, with theorems proved are happening um, here. And then we've got inspired by the Gillian platform with all the optimizations. And the glue, maybe one of the legs of the rider, is um, Daniele, who um, uh, instead of working with the Haskell implementation, um, was uh, working with pseudocode and proving results in the theory. But all of this absolutely inspired from what came here, and there was huge back and forth in terms of pulling out the ideas and then uh, writing them down in this clean place. So now I start in the theoretical place. Which is the goal is um, the integration of OX and UX reasoning in compositional symbolic execution. And what I mean by compositional um, symbolic execution is I'm totally inspired by the work of all those separation logics. And in particular, um, when you call a function, you have a specification that's working on partial memory and you're working with the function um, uh, by itself rather than with um, uh, working with some whole uh, state and main. And then the integration of OX and UX reasoning, for now what I mean is we've got semantic triples either in separation logic or um, incorrectness separation logic. I've just been told from the back to move back here. <laughs> so, um, and in particular, so this is what we're doing. And in particular, my questions are how to um, isolate the part that's common to both styles of reasoning, how to function compositionality in a unified way, how to be compatible with specifications that have come from elsewhere, and how to be adaptable to different programming languages, different memory models, and different implementation choices. So here we have um, a symbolic state, 
And think of this as we're in the middle of the body of a function that we're trying to uh, um, analyze. And so we've got the whole state, everything we know is known about, uh, we're guessing what we think the um, specification is. So we've got the precondition, and we've, so we've got that symbolic state. And we are um, uh, doing symbolic execution using the command C and getting an outcome that can be OK, error, or missing. It can be missing because we're in this partial memory world coming from the separation logic um, inspiration. So we can have uh, things can maybe not terminate, but also for a bit that we're interested in, either from the precondition in the OX world or the bit that's uh, well, uh, from the precondition, um, we uh, um, end up in OK error or missing. We know that with the OX reasoning, you can drop information along execution paths, but you can't drop execution paths. And with the UX reasoning, the flip, you can um, drop execution paths, but not information along those execution paths. And we have this unified compositional um, engine that basically as we're, when we're doing a function call, this is just one step out of that um, command C, we um, have the whole state, we identify which part corresponds to the precondition of the um, uh, specification of the function, and uh, we consume that part and put in the, what we get from the um, post-condition of that specification. And what we have is this axiomatic interface that, uh, that says, um, it gives the criteria necessary for this lot to be done in a way that is sound. So let me... <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I've never managed to do that. Do you know, uh, Popple has lapel mics just because at some Zoom meeting I went, no, when everybody else has said, he, yes, we're happy in the static place. So, um, <laughs> thank you, Sasha. So here we have a um, whole symbolic state here. And we've got this specification that's either UX or OX. And we um, consume the precondition, le get left with the frame, put in the post condition, and we've got OX and or new X soundness based on this axiomatic interface, which is this. And the axiomatic interface is basically saying the partial memory is working well that when one has path uh, strengthening because as you go down symbolic execution, always the resulting uh, um, path condition um, implies the um, path condition at the beginning. This consume function uh, cap uh, covers the um, assertion we're interested in, meaning we know how the variables are working. And we have soundness and um, completeness properties associated with the consume and produce functions. And then we have a, a soundness result, whether it be in the UX or OX way. And the point about it is that these properties are independent of the memory model, independent of the language, an implementation of the and impl uh, independent of the um, particular implementations of the consume and produce functions. So now I want to go on to this Haskell Im implementation, emphasizing that it's just a clean version of what's going on in the Jillian implementation. But I'm going to do it at this place. 
and only by example. So the challenge is to get the consume function. Produce is easier. So the consume is the important one, and produce is completely uniform with respect to OX and UX reasoning. The difference between them comes in the um, consume. So the assertion P um, uh, consists of pure, a pure part and a spatial part. That spatial part can, be, uh, can have predicates in them or can be just the simple uh, core cell assertions. And we have the question of, can we find um, a matching theta and appropriate splitting of the, of the symbolic heap so that these two properties hold in the OX world we have the implication, and in the UX world, we have the um, uh, satisfaction uh, question. And this is, uh, let's drill down, it's actually very intertwined. In fact, we've got a matching bit and a frame inference bit, which I can explain using this example. So here we have this state, this symbolic state, and an assertion, and we want to call this function. So we need to do a matching between this and some of this state. Using this consume function. So what happens is that we start with um, the function call, that expression gets evaluated to that V, and, we, and the theta here is corresponding to that um, v or, and whatever you need in terms of the variables associated with the function. So we have some knowledge about how to start, which in this case is the x. And at this point, we were now working completely separate from um, the state. And with this knowledge, we are going to um, match and learn about the missing bindings that we need here. And we do this using something called um, a matching plan, which gives automatic reordering of the assertions to find these bindings. So this is different from what's going on in Verifast and Viper, where it's up to the user to find the ordering. And we're doing it um, automatically. And in particular, I was emphasizing earlier that maybe the specifications have come from outside our tool, we don't necessarily have control of what's going on with the ordering. So what's happening in this case? We start off with this knowledge x. So that ends up, because of x, we now get to the y. So here, we don't know what y is yet. It's going to be that v. But at the moment, we've just got some variable denoting um, what the value of that y is going to be. And then because we now know this bit, we now know this bit because given the, the y and the 21, we know the z. So given the y and the 21, we know the z and can write it like this. And given that we know the z, we now know the w. And given that we know the W, we know something about the list. So this is the matching plan. And now we do the rest of the consume. Which is, we have that matching. And, and so the, I think the matching plan is uh, it's very known in the, in, the, in the community, but is not really used much in the, um, the tools associated with separation logic. The, um, the rest of the consume involving frame inference is well known and is nothing special to what we are doing. So in particular, if I show you a particular um, state, then what does it mean to consume? It just means finding it. So in particular, here we start off with the information that x equals 1. Um, because x equals 1, we know how to link that um, matching plan, the first part of that matching plan, to the bit of the symbolic state we need. So here we've um, got it. Then, because of that, 
we know that y um, is 2. And because of y is 2, we then know about the z. So, so this z goes away. And now, because of the z, we know that the y, uh, the, uh, 2 plus 21 is 23. So we go back looking at the heap again, the symbolic heap again. Uh, or no, the, the, in this case, the concrete. And get to um, this uh, cell here. And so we go on. And we get to the list. And at the list place, we have to do the unfolding, as one would expect. And we unfold knowing that that W is 3. Finding the next um, cell and ending up with 4 going to null. We found the bit we needed. And ended up here. So this bit is not particularly novel, but the matching plan before it is um, really rather um, interesting. So in particular, I still want to drill down further. And here we've got the rules for the successful rules and the error rules associated with the um, consume function. And in particular, for OX and UX reasoning, most of the rules are doing the same thing. In the success case, for, cons, for the pure bit, we've got something. Uh, it, that's the only bit where things are different. And in particular, for the... Um, uh, for the pure bit, if we've got an example such as this, where we know that Z is between the, the uh, 500 and the 1500, then in this case, for this precondition, we haven't got the, the implication here. So this is where the, uh, the OX difference. And here with the UX, we've got this. This is the UX difference. But this is the only difference. So. Everything else is the same. Oops. So. And if we go back here, with the error rules, basically we've got um, the uh, we've got the error cases, and what happens with the OX world? We end up um, aborting if we can't find the match and stopping. The verification has gone on. And with the, um, with the UX uh, rules, we've got, a, we've got a subtlety going on, which is either we just let everything back, uh, those particular path expressions, those path, um, paths uh, vanish, or we fix, sometimes we fix by, by abduction when we've got the resource, when we can fix with respect to the resource. So in this case, with the um, OX, if we don't have um, uh, we can't, we don't have the resource because we've got a clash going on, then we really end up with a um, error, and that error won't be fixed. In the UX way, you have to vanish. In um, the consumer way, you are bought. Uh, the OX way, you are bought. With but if you have a missing possible cell. In the UX way, well, actually in both, but especially with UX by abduction, you can um, fix that missing error. And this rule is just saying how you fix that error. So we've understood this except for at the level of the matching plan. So in particular, We've only grabbed at what the matching plan for Gillian is. It's good with respect to the way of thinking spatially. We can work well with um, cells. We can work well with the predicates. But we're restricted in terms of the expressions. And we're very lucky to have Daniele on board who knows about matching and uh, absolutely knows uh, the subtleties of how to think about expressions. So we're only learning from equalities, and we only have one variable um, as we uh, 
at each step of the matching plan. And that is no, I mean, you know, that's, that's cutting out a lot of the complexity of what's going on. And just to say, we do realize it was just where we were at the time. But the pros of this is that we're actually really um, improving with respect to the uh, things like Verifast and Viper because we've got these matching plans. And um, we're doing it in a way that works with both UX and OX reasoning. But we've, gone to, uh, we've got lots to do to understand where to uh, be in the space of how well can we get these matching plans. And in particular, it's known in the first order world how to solve the equations with uh, Diophantine equations. And Daniele is um, sort of exploring how to bring this to the separation logic uh, world that will be expanding the known ideas from this world to uh, the separation logic place. But that's only half the story because that's the key th theoretical result. And then actually, what are the right choices for the various tools in terms of uh, uh, automatically creating um, matching plans? I do not know the answer. And perhaps people in the audience know the answer better than me. And then there, and there's some choices to be made that will and uh, suggestions that will help us here. But this is our question without knowing the answer yet. So this is where we are, and now I'll talk about Gillian that was always our inspiration. Because of the axiomatic interface, we are parametric with respect to the um, implementations of consume and produce. What we're doing next, and we haven't done the theory, but we have done the Gillian tool, is that we're parametric with respect to the memory model. And so basically the um, history of how Gillian has been working is that you've got a core symbolic execution engine and um, it's, it's working with respect to an intermediate representation that we happen to call Jill. And it's parametric, it parametric in the sense that um, uh, we can put arbitrary, uh, essentially arbitrary memory models in there. So for example, we've done JavaScript and C with their very different memory models. And we can do whole program symbolic um, testing using the sort of correctness guarantees that CBMC does. Yeah. But then can we be compositional? Can we get the um, working with these function specif specifications in this compositional way um, expounded by separation logic? So basically, yes, we can, and we get the sort of guarantees as Verifast and uh, Viper, and not only do we have um, uh, the starting basic um, actions associated with the memory model, we need core predicates to, like, such as that cell assertion. <coughs> and this one's very much, we have the OX switch. And that's to do with the consume pure bit. I'm a bit out of time. That's why I'm uh, um, going over a bit. And then we can do the true bug finding with the UX um, uh, switch. And what do we need? We need to, from the missing resource, generate um, fixes that give us um, the by abduction so that we lose that uh, missing bit. And that was something that was buried inside work that we did in um, JavaScript a long time ago, the, to have fixes from errors. That's how, how to think about by abduction. And uh, that was in the OX world. And now we're in the UX world and it just ports over very nicely. And the sort of things we do, we're in the, I like this toy lab laboratory. 
I want to do lots of, you know, do lots and lots of things such as concurrency and this and that, and I'm quite happy not being so uh, real world. But here we've got some real world stuff going on. And uh, just recently, Sasha has um, done some work on Gillian Rust on unsafe code for Rust. And the sort of applications we do for while it's looking at data structure algorithms and teaching our course in uh, fourth year, we also um, have done symbolic testing for JavaScript and C in a couple of real world libraries. We've also done um, full verification of AWS code, this code, some of it. Um, uh, and this was rather lovely because they had two implementations, one in JavaScript and one in C, and we could do both of them um, working with the same abstractions at some point. So that was uh, something that we were pleased about. And in particular, you know, lots of, lots of tools um, do uh, full verification in industry now, especially those academic tools wanting some respectability and also wanting to push their ideas eventually into industry. And um, the thing that's really good here, and it was done by Sasha and Petter, is that we've got these high-level specifications, but we're also really working at that bytecode level and um, uh, uh, going to that real world place where as this um, list very dynamically changes, so um, uh, the reasoning still makes sense. And then Sasha's Rust work is on um, standard library and in particular unsafe Rust code. So the last thing I want to do is to push a little bit to the um, uh, debugging that we've done for Jillian. So basically, this AWS code is awesome. They were working with these macho file logs. And the fact that they could do anything was extraordinary. And actually, there's been quite an agenda of doing debugging led by Sasha. And here's some MSc students that turn into a, an, another MSc student who's now my uh, PhD student who um, did a big step. So basically now um, we've got, uh, we've got a, a visual debugger with a VS Code interface. I'm not going through this. Basically, we've got the dub debugger integrated with the Jillian engine, and we're lifting up to the source language. And if you don't mind, I will. It will be so sad not to do this, so I'm going to do this bit. It's not working. Can't hear, though. Nat, do you have anything to say, given that you are up there sorting out the AV, or do we... Um, I think, given time, probably not. Sure. Yes. He's got um, a very lovely demo that basically is... It, please come and see it afterwards if you would like. And in particular, sort of the main messages are that um, with this interface, we can now get to the students. We've done two... Uh, uh, really successful labs where they're really wanting to work um, with this stuff. And in particular, one of the things he does is push through into, those, into that matching. So, uh, so we can actually look at the step in the matching and work out where things are not working. So the first thing he did as an MSc student, he did the work, and then in about a week, panic, after he'd submitted his um, MSc um, report, but hadn't gone to real world code because he wanted to go to real world code, he uh, um, ended up finding the AWS bugs that we'd previously found. He found only in a week with no expertise on the Jillian stuff. And... Um, we're now on to lifting the errors from the intermediate representation back to the source place. Um, done it for uh, Gillian Weil 
and and now working with Gillian C, but now with respect to CBMC, not Compsert, so that we can do the lifting. And this follows on from Sasha had an internship out inside AWS, where he was hooking to this work and doing comparison between uh, the various uh, CBMC and his work. Here's the student lab, and this is where we want to go. His uh, PhD project is CDAP, which is this symbolic debugger. He um, wants an interface between the um, editors and IDEs and the symbolic tools. We're currently on um, Jillian. Um, uh, Jules is going to be the uh, external supervisor and let me say this. So uh, um, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could end up getting to infer too? You know, this, the point is it's not just about Gillian. This is a general um, symbolic debugger. And then where does this go? Uh, that's not to explore. So we've got this agenda. We are beginning to marry the theory and practice together. You can see that there's much still to do. The future agenda, will I ever make uh, Patrice happy in terms of uh, what, should I, what should this really be? Not sure. But one thing we are doing is next week, Noam is coming to visit us in um, Imperial because we are, um, when we saw outcome logic, we went, yeah, because we'd had uh, ideas that, that were in their work and we would, uh, we're would we exploring whether it makes sense to uh, do things together. But I was very aware of the whole incorrectness workshop, where actually should we be in this space for that? Well, it starts off with exact core symbolic execution engine with um, um, OK, error, missing, but the missings go away with by abduction, and maybe even stop, meaning you don't do any more. You decide to stop. Sometime in the OX world, you stop and um, abort. In the UX world, you prune the path. So where should one be in this space and um, what sort of um, uh, semantic triples work with respect to um, these choices? I'm not quite sure. The future is not just about the unified stuff. It's also, instead of Haskell, let's do the cock work and get it more um, properly integrated. Uh, Andreas has spent a lot of time in the cock world, actually, with uh, uh, Ethereum proof of world, actually, on KML and going to hardware. So, so he's very interested in that stuff. And a new student, uh, Simon, is um, interested. And we're also very much uh, thinking of next generation Trillion. We're parametric um, in the, uh, with respect to the memory model. Our results mean that it doesn't matter what the implementation um, is with respect to, um, as long as it satisfies those properties that I um, put up. But actually, we can be parametric in the language too. We don't need to go to this intermediate representation that we've chosen. We can have any... Um, interpreter as long as some properties are holding and how should we uh, explore this and move this to the next generation well we can because we've got this axiomatic representation theory to practice this integration may be on the way and I'd like to conclude with my uh, um, favorite slide which is is this the cutest photo of Popple 24. And I'd like to thank a student there who um, showed me this. And he came into the room going, is this the best uh, photo? This is Katerina Irvin's um, son, uh, Matteo, and uh, Patrice. And maybe the, 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 um, the, he is the next generation of um, abstract interpretation. How many decades will it take? <laughs> Okay, no pressure. So, uh, <laughs> question in the room? Patrick? Uh, yeah. 
in a symbolic execution, there is a difficulty which is induction. And uh, uh, in separation logic, it's even worse because <laughs> uh, the domain is, is incomplete. And uh, how do you guess it has this structure or another? So it's predeclared, but uh, again, it's a problem in induction. So you have the problem in symbolic execution and in. Uh, so what are you doing about yes, that? I don't know. So you leave it for the next yeah, generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, leave, I leave it for the experts. I leave it for the experts. That's, okay. Yeah. One day. <laughs> but I would say that's the only the true problem. Oh, of course you would. <laughs> the rest is engineering. <laughs> No, I get it. I get it. I just did. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much for the talk.